Hey, oh, welcome everyone to episode 32 of Today in the Scene. I'm Joe with Indie Arcade Wave, and this week we're going to explore a new arcade that's opening up near Minneapolis called Starcade. This arcade is going to house a ton of classic games and new games as well. So I'm joined today by Brian Armitage, who's one of the co owners. Uh, how are you doing today, Brian? Good. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm glad you could come on. Um, I know before the show we were talking about the podcast that you do, which is called Arcade Radio. Um, so if anybody wants to check that one out, go ahead and find them on major platforms and or YouTube. Um, I kind of want to just jump right in here, Brian, and start talking about the arcade. Uh, but first off, let's talk about you. So what do you do on a day-to-day basis, Brian? Uh, actually, on a day-to-day basis, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and then my wife and I have a collaboration of running Paradise Arcade Shop. So I, uh, I keep quite busy and decided... Let's add some more uh, fun to the mix. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's always something else to add. And I've seen the collection that you have, and it's incredible. Some of the games that you have, um, I know we were speaking when I came over to your house and you were talking about how these games are quite rare, and it was cool to see them. Um, I want to know how you first got into video games, arcade games, um, and what kind of sparked off collecting for you. Uh, well, actually, so the thing that started it all was I bought my wife, who is my girlfriend at the time, a Galaga for Christmas. And she had gone out to California, hanging out with some friends of hers, spent some time with an ex-boyfriend and came back and said, oh, I got this. I played Galaga and had a great time. So I decided I need to one up the whole thing. Uh, and went out and bought what was advertised as an original Galaga cabinet. Turns out it was a, so I turn, we turn it on, we play it. And she says to me, why does it say Galag instead of Galaga? And I come to discover not only is it not an original Galaga, uh, it's a Galag knockoff board in a Stratavox cabinet. But in the process of doing this research, I start learning more and more about these games. And in the process of doing that, I I find another game for sale. And so I bought that one and then I bought another one and, and it just kind of snowballed from there. Um, until our basement out in Stillwater had 13 or 14 games. It was pretty full. Uh, and then I actually talked to a friend of mine that ran a cafe uh, in Stillwater called Shane's on Main. And um, in an attempt to continue building my collection, I would buy games and put them into his cafe. <laughs> and uh, it just kept going. Uh, it's, it's one of those things where once you get into it and you figure out how to fix them, they just kind of seem to crawl out of everywhere. You come across one that just needs a little bit of love and you can fix it. So you say, why not? I'll grab that one too. Yeah. And, and I mean, the other thing that happens too, is you, as you get going, people start calling you and saying, Hey, I found this. Do you want it? Uh, and back in 2007, when I started the first games that I bought, I mean, back then you could still find say a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Actually, it was funny because back then Konami's weren't very popular. So I went and bought a Moon Patrol one time. And I paid like 200, 250 bucks for it, which back then was, you know, you they'd put it up for 300, you negotiate them down. Now, if you found it for 300, you'd run. Uh, and you show up and the guy is sitting there with like, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in his garage, which is a big Konami 4 player. And they literally sit there and say, hey, will you just take that one for free? I don't have room for it. Uh, and that's, you know, so a lot of people who got back into the, who got into the hobby then or before then, uh, games were cheap. And then uh, that all started to turn around in the last 10 years. Yeah, with the emergence of the arcade bar scene where you basically can walk into anyone anywhere in the country and you're going to see a a TMNT in there. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's, what happened is the games that are popular tend to be the ones that were, you know, when you see people who remembered playing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in the 90s, right? So they're, they're now the ones who actually have the resources to go out and buy the game. Uh, earlier on, you know, it was kind of games of the eighties and games of the seventies. So it, it cycles through, um, there are some rare ones that go up in value, but you know, you look at a, a Konami cabinet now is in the mid thousands. I mean, that was, people were literally trying to give them away back then, but, uh, it's, you know, it, it's one of those hobbies that once you figure out a few things and you start playing with it and you start to learn the history on the games, it just becomes very interesting to keep going. Um, and the collection, got a huge shot in the arm in Hawaii when there was a local auction that uh, in Hawaii, there weren't a lot of collectors and we bought a ridiculous number of machines, something like 80 to 90 machines in this auction. And I split them up with a, a friend of mine there. Uh, and I mean, there were original dedicated ramparts. There was a, 
Uh, I bought two major Havocs, two iRobots, four Warlords. I mean, just machines that you don't see that often. And the pricing was ridiculously cheap. Uh, and so it, it was that was when I started to learn a lot more about the rare games because I ended up owning a bunch of them just by chance. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I like I said, you've got some pretty crazy ones in, the, in, in your house that I've just never even heard of. Um, I'm wondering, how did Starcade come to be? You said you're a co-owner. You told me that there are a handful of people that are involved in this business. Um, how did you guys come together and make this happen? So there's there were there's three guys involved in in Starcade, and uh, basically what happened is a friend of mine, Paul Saarinen, approached me one day and said, "Hey, I I want to do an arcade, but I don't have enough games to do that." Uh, and so I, I'd really love to manage it, run it, uh, do the day-to-day -day stuff, organize it. It would be fun to do, but I need to collaborate with some people who know more about the machines and who have machines, who have machines that would draw people in. Uh, so he and I approached another friend of mine and uh, the three of us started chatting about it. And it just kind of became one of those things that made sense to do. Uh, we've had a couple of locations we looked at. We actually, right before COVID, were literally about to sign a lease uh another person in the community who's trying to do some entertainment stuff came to us asked us to look at a separate building and looking at that separate building actually stalled us signing our initial lease uh, which was incredibly fortuitous um we stalled on the lease and then within like four weeks we're kind of like talking about it the COVID shutdown started and so we just took a step back from things. And for the last year, basically, we've been looking at buying buildings, renting buildings, trying to figure out what made the most sense, but not jumping on anything. Uh, and then about three or four months ago, uh, three or four months ago, Paul was talking to Roseville Mall. And, um, you know, as the old mafia saying goes, they made us an offer we couldn't refuse. <laughs> uh, I mean, they really they, they were very accommodating to us to try and do something when they learned about what we were doing. Uh, you know, we're trying to create kind of a unique experience that is not is not bar based, um, that is family friendly, but at the same time has games that you literally won't be able to play anywhere else. Um, I'm sure until Doc puts them on his floor eventually, but um, we're going to have some stuff there. We have some stuff there that that you just don't get to see very often. So you said it's going to be more of a, a family-friendly environment, steering away from the arcade bar, which is what seems to be popping up everywhere. What are you guys going to have there? What's your like payment model? Is this going to be like a you pay per game, you pay when you get in? Are there are there drinks? Is there food? What are you guys doing there? So we are actually in the Roseville Mall between Chipotle and Granite City. So the oh, way we see it is, good. yeah, I mean, and the, and our model is just it's a fifteen dollar entry for the day, and once you pay, you can come and go as much as you want. So we're really seeing ourselves as a, um, you know, part of an evening, not an entire evening. So you go see a movie, grab some dinner, come play arcade games. Uh, you know, as, as far as the food and drink goes, none of us have a lot of experience in that. And that's a whole like running a restaurant and running a bar is a, is a whole realm of management and uh, permits and responsibility that we just looked at and said, it's not our expertise. So let's do what we do well. And if we do that well, people will come, they will enjoy it, we'll have fun. And we can kind of share the draw of our location with these restaurants and other things that are literally right next door. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a whole beast to open up when you start bringing in food and then to bring alcohol in on top. I mean, I know bars that had to make a transition that once they were able to open back up, they had to bring in food, which they had never done, which was a whole new beast that they had to try and tackle. So just going the arcade route sounds pretty smart for you guys. Yeah. And I mean, it, it also allows us, I mean, it allows us to do a few things and to explore some avenues and invest kind of more of our resources into providing, uh, you know, a better experience. I think we're not sitting there debating what the menu is going to be. We're going out and finding rare games. I mean, in the last two months, um, I've picked up a blasted, a boomeranger, and oh gosh, now I can't even remember. There's <laughs> oh, a um, Interstellar, which is a really rare laser disc game. And so, you know, these are the kinds of things that are going to be popping up on the floor. So instead of debating which French fry we're going to go with or which beer list we're going to go with, 
we're out there trying to find stuff to bring a, a different experience. And the goal is to have that experience rotate on the floor. I mean, there'll be some, some standards that stick around. You're probably always going to be able to come in and play Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man and Donkey Kong and Burger Time and those kinds of games. But you're going to see a lot of games that you've never seen before. And with the $15 pay at the door, you don't have to worry about dropping a quarter in a game and losing in 20 seconds. You can play as many times as you want. Yeah, try and get a feel for that game that you've never seen, never heard of, but now you're wondering what it is. I'm curious as to what games you guys are going to bring in that um, are more on the rare side. Like, is there anything in specific that stands out to you as a collector? Uh, one of the games that uh, I think will shock people that it's on the floor is we put in the War of the Worlds, uh, which is a factory dedicated War of the Worlds, which is uh, an extremely rare game and not common. Um, there are some conversions out there, but there, there are not many factory dedicated ones. Um, <clears throat> so that'll be available for everybody. Uh, we had Speed Freak, but unfortunately Speed Freak went down. Speed Freak is the only vector driving game ever uh, made. We'll have that back up and going soon. We do have Tail Gunner, which is another rare uh, cinematronics vector, which is a lot of fun. Blasted is actually a game that the artwork, this is the one we just brought in, all done by Brian Collin of Rampage uh, fame. And it's kind of this neat joystick shooting game. Um, and we actually have a dedicated cabinet, which again is not, not very common. Um, aside from that, I'm trying to like go through the list in my head of stuff. <clears throat> it's funny because a lot of the stuff that we put in there is stuff that I pulled. Um, basically, I just pulled from my, th my collection and put in there. We'd have a Tron and a Discs of Tron. We have a Star Wars cockpit that's in there. We have a Mach 3 that's going out on the floor. Uh, six player X Men, which seem to be at every arcade bar, yeah, but um, all over the place. they're not very common actually in the collecting world. All the arcade right. bars snatched them up. Um, those are the ones that really stick out right now in my head. We are going to put in the Exterminator, uh, which is another very odd, fun, weird game, uh, but that needs to be extracted from my basement before it gets there. And right now, with the snow, we're not excited about that. <laughs> yeah, moving. Uh heavy arcade cabinets in the snow is it's a lot of fun i've experienced yeah yeah it's something to be avoided especially with ice that's definitely definitely a time you want to move it um i'm curious as to what indie games you guys are thinking about are there any that you would be interested in putting in there so i know uh so we've, we've talked to kelly about putting in galactic battlegrounds yep i'll uh, be in there i'm excited to check out the place which we're really excited about um we have talked to killer queen about possibly putting in a uh, a, a killer queen and I discussed with those guys, we, we actually, um, our history with them goes way back to one of their first times they expoed the game at, um, Evo and we were at Evo selling parts and their game, their, their joysticks kept breaking down because they use zippy joysticks on their first units. That is, of that's, that's a tip for, uh, anybody that's building an arcade cabinet, a main cabinet or anything, uh, avoid the zippies and just spend the money on good joysticks. You'll yeah. be happy especially in a commercial environment. I mean, these guys, they just, they, they fell apart. And so I was running over there and fixing their stuff. But one of the things that we were talking to them about and kind of uh, hopefully uh, resuming negotiations when I can have some more time is uh, setting up a unit where people could bring in sticks and plug them in. So even during COVID, you could have some separation, but allow people to play. So people aren't crowded by the machine with everybody on top of each other. So we thought that would be a kind of neat setup to do. Um, aside from that, we, we really haven't approached, uh, many indie developers at this point. It's, you know, we're trying to get our feet under us and, uh, and figure out how this model is going to work. Is this environment work? Do we need to find a bigger building, a smaller space? Um, and we're open to ideas. So we are glad that, uh, uh, Galactic approached us. Uh, that was, that was nice and asked about it. Uh, we're hoping to see what happens with Killer Queen. Um, and then we'll keep our eyes open. Uh, the only other game that may end up in there, which is kind of an open source game, is I am trying to find the time to uh, build up a battle. I have an extra battle zone cabaret, and I'm trying to find time to build up a battle zone two cabinet, which is just a really fun game somebody released uh, for public consumption. It's a it's a neat version of an updated battle zone. It'd be awesome to have something. I mean, that'd be the only one of its kind, would it not? Uh, actually, I, I have to say Brian Jones down in uh, Florida, who runs Free Play Florida, has built one already. Uh, and, <clears throat> and Brian does a great job with this stuff. 
so his is probably going to be nicer than the one I finished. I can't really contend with somebody that does the work he does, <laughs> but uh, we'll have a nice one. It'll be a cabaret version. That's awesome. I mean, that's it's still very unique to be one of two in, in the country. Yeah. The world, maybe even. Well, and it, I mean, it's it's a neat game. I mean, Battlezone is one of those games that uh, Atari really, you know, hit the ground with. It. I mean, they, they came up with this amazing concept and a lot of their stuff they revisited later. I mean, look at Asteroids, Asteroids Deluxe, then Deluxe, then Blasteroids. I mean, they they kind of revisited things, but they never revisited Battlezone, which oh, which doesn't make any sense. Like, why would they not revisit this game that? I really had a lot of following. And so uh, hopefully uh, we'll see what people think about it. Maybe people will love it. Maybe they'll think it's too easy. It's too hard. Um, you can play it actually on the computer right now, just with the keyboard, but that's not the same as having the two joysticks and, you know, forward and backwards and having to figure out how to drive a tank. Right. The keyboard will never do justice to something that should be on a cabinet. No, uh, it, it never has, and it never will. It's kind of fun for looking at stuff. Um, and I will admit that I go on and I have a full main li- ROM library that I'll go on and, and fire up a game and say, okay, what is this one like when somebody's advertising it? Boomerangers is a great example. Example. I'd never even seen the game. Um, it went up for sale. I checked it out on MAME and I'm like, okay, this is kind of weird and a lot of fun. Uh, so I'll go and and find those ones on MAME just to test them out, but then you get the cabinet and you can't go back. Right. Um, so what is, what is Starcade going to be like? What are the hours going to be like? When are you going to, guys going to be open? Yeah, that's it. So we actually, we are just modifying our hours. So one of the things that we're realizing is that we need to build in some repair time for these machines because a lot of the stuff we're running is, you know, 40 years old. Um, so we will be open uh, for the arcade uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, right now, the hours are 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., basically mall hours. And those might be widened or compressed over time. We'll see what happens. We will be open Mondays and Tuesdays for retail sales. There's a limited number of cabinets we have that are for sale. We have some buck hunters that uh, uh, we have that are up for sale. And so if people want to buy cabinets, we'll be open to sell cabinets pretty much seven days a week. But the arcade itself uh, is going to be a Tuesday through Sunday. Gotcha. Okay. That's a that's a cool schedule. I like that it's just $15. Get in, play all you want. Um, and that's going to be for the day, obviously. So you can spend some time at the mall, check some other stuff out, and also play kind of here and there when you want to. Um, tell me a little bit about paradise what do you what do you do at paradise how did that come to be um how long have you been doing that all that kind of stuff yeah pa- uh paradise has been around for about a decade now uh we actually figured that out saturday night because we inst- we just uh transferred over to the shopify platform from our old platform and in the process the shopify platform sent f- uh over forty thousand emails out to every order that's ever been placed in the store that's and uh, a lot of emails. We, we had people writing us saying, I didn't order something recently. And we're looking at this going, wow, we've been at this since 2010. Um, basically, um, it's actually kind of a funny story. I moved to Hawaii, didn't have any games, had been used to having games. I was in Hawaii for residency. And uh, I decided to build a cabinet. I found a cabinet. I decided to build a MAME system. And I found these LED buttons. Uh, that I wanted that Ultimark had, but they were really expensive. And this was back before anybody had really heard about Alibaba or any of this stuff. And so I went online and I was looking for them and I found this site that nobody knew about called Alibaba at the time. This is back in 2009, literally. And um, I could get the buttons cheap, but I had to get 200 of them. So 200 of them was less expensive than buying the 15 I needed. So I said, all right, well, forget, I'll just buy the 200 and see what they're like. I mean, what's the worst that can happen with that many extra buttons, right? Yeah. You can always well, use them to fix something else. And well, and exactly. So I, I get them in and I, I was shocked that they actually were really good quality. And so, and so I um, installed them in the cabinet. I'm like, all right, I got an extra 185 buttons, threw them up on KLOV and they were sold within like a day. And I went, oh, okay. And so I, so I ordered another 200. 
and those were sold within a week. And it just kind of rolled from there. Um, some of the things that are kind of funny, the zippy joysticks, which I do not like, um, we actually were the ones who brought them to the U S <laughs> uh, we were the Gombas adapter boards, which everybody's seen for the CGA to VGA conversion two years in a row. We were the largest distributor of Gombas boards in the U S uh, drop shipping for even companies like twisted quarter. Um, and it started out literally out of our kitchen when it outgrew the two shelving racks that we had two, like, you know, two foot by three foot shelving racks in our kitchen that the whole store ran out of when we needed more space. Uh, it, <laughs> it moved to our bedroom. So we had four racks and then, uh, Susan used to pack orders on the bed and then, uh, we outgrew that. We ended up actually <clears throat> made the decision to get a house that was a little bit bigger in Hawaii and use the money from the store to help pay our rent. And, uh, it got its own room at that point with extra storage in a, uh, kind of like a sheltered garage type area in Hawaii, Hawaii. They don't really have garages on most houses. It's just kind of carports. Um, and it just kept snowballing from there. Uh, it was, it, you know, at first the intention was just to help cover rent. And, um, then it just became this thing that we do for fun. Uh, as of, you know, aside from helping to pay for the space that it was in, um, like I said, covering a uh, portion of the rent, uh, Susan and I have actually never taken a salary or income from the store in 10 years. So all the money that's generated by the store rolls back into the store to develop new products. Um, we help create products for other people in the community. Um, we really see it as something that's kind of fun to do that we enjoy doing and giving opportunities to other people. Uh, I joke sometimes that the employees at the store, uh, the guys that work with us, the work for us actually have made more money from paradise than I have. <laughs> that's funny. That's, that's, I mean, it is really cool. And I mean, I, I can see that. Like when I go in there, it seems like you got a couple guys working on machines and there's always something getting fixed and you guys helped us build our cabinets for galactic battleground and kind of showed us the ropes as to how to do that and what to get and what not to get. Um, on that line, I've, I've talked to a lot of the indie guys and, they were in touch with you early on in their days of cabinet building. And I'm sure you answered plenty of questions for them. Uh, what has interested you in the growth of the indie scene since I believe killer queen was like 2010, 2008, something like that. I, I think the the really neat thing about the indie scene is kind of this recognition that you can't play everything on a console, that there's an element to an arcade cabinet that is important. And, you know, one of the things, if you talk to some of the original designers of games like um, like the game I've actually got my computer on right now is my Cocktail Berserk. Um, the game was one thing, but the controls were another thing. And people get so wrapped up in creating an environment. If you look at modern games, they're so wrapped up in the graphics and the sound and everything else, they forget that. This is an experience and the way that you connect the user or the player to that experience is through the controls. And in the case of say berserk cabinets, the joystick's terrible, right? I mean, it's a horrible joystick. It's clunky. It's hard to use and it makes the game hard. And that wasn't by accident. And so selecting the appropriate control and the appropriate cabinet design and the appropriate presentation is a part of that experience. Playing a, a game on your computer at home uh, or on your console at home is one thing, and it's fun. I, there's nothing wrong with that. But an arcade game or a cabinet is, is an interactive experience that engages a person through touch, through sight, through sound. Um, sometimes unfortunately through smell of the, uh, arcade you're in, but it's, it really is something that is, is all, is a much more encompassing experience. And I think that that's one of the things I see the indie designers getting the hang of. Um, you look at some of the games like the new game, uh, by killer queen and using a roller to, you know, just a simple roller to create a game. You look at games like, uh, uh was it the, um, switch and shoot where it's just a, a button, but it's, a, you know, a, it's kind of this large presentation of a button in front. Uh, you look at, um, I, I am like completely blanking on Tony's game right now. Death ball. 
death ball and the way he designs the cabinet and the screen and the interaction. I mean, just the simple aspect of coordinating colors of controls with colors on the screen and matching those things up. And that harkens back to when you look at some of the old Williams games like Defender and Stargate, where though that created an environment and a place for people to really experience the game different than you could on just a console. Right. I mean, even like tying in like GBG and having the, the marquee, that's a infinity mirror, which you don't see and killer queen having 10 players on two cabinets, like these massive, massive, what they have to be like 50 plus inch screens. Um, it makes it so much more enjoyable as a player to play that. And it, it gives a dedicated space to the game as opposed to just buying a game on your Xbox and playing on your screen at home. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's like, so GBG is a great example where the lighting in the front of the cabinet lights up for the teams that are there. And then it goes away as the players die. And then the, uh, the power ups being the appropriate color on the button. I mean, those kinds of things you just don't get. Um, And then there's just the fact that, you know, cabinets, especially a lot of the, in the indie developers, are getting this uh some didn't early on but it's happened more and more where like you push on a joystick the machine shouldn't move right right like you you should be able to manhandle that machine and enjoy it it's a physical experience um i'm not advocating that people beat on machines (laughs) but at the same time you should be able to shove the machine a little bit in frustration or in excitement and not have it slide across the floor Right. I mean, it's the same concept as pinball and giving it that little bump, but not bumping it too much to tilt it. Exactly. So, I I mean, it's, and, you know, I think that that aspect of the indie community and what they're bringing out is, is really exciting to see. Um, You take, and then you take some games like Cosmotrons, uh, you know, Shane um, and Dave really going back to some original game theory and looking at what is the theory behind what makes a game a game. And so Cosmotron is a very simple vectorized game. I mean, from an artwork perspective, but the depth of the game is such that it, it really, it's going to draw the user in for the play as opposed to this, like, you know, fantastical background scenery. Right. It's a fun game and it's very difficult. So as you play it and you get better, you like really, you feel the value of your time. Like you feel like you're really getting a hang for it. Exactly. Well, and, and they've done, I mean, it's really funny. Some of the things, um, the, those guys, one of the things I thought they did well, and this is one of the neat things with a lot of the indie developers. I know Galactic did this. Uh, I know Tony did this is listening to the players Mm -hmm. and responding to what the players are saying they need. Galactic is a difficult, uh, sorry, um, <clears throat> Cosmotrons is a very difficult game. They heard that and people were getting wiped out very quickly. So they made this. So the little, once your ship gets blown up and you lose your lives, a little guy falls out, lands on the ground. And then that little guy can sit there and just shoot other people on the screen. And so they introduced this aspect of a game where like you're dead, but you're not quite dead yet. Yeah, you're, you're dead, but you can still have an effect on the end of the game. And that, and that was, I mean, that was really brilliant on their part to, to kind of come up with this way of staying engaged in the game, despite having lost, you're not going to win, but you can, you can affect the outcome. And that was, you know, seeing indie developers push things like that is really a a kind of cool thing to see. Yeah. I mean, not to mention the cabinet design on that game. It's incredible. It, It. It's the only one like it. There's there's no other cabinet that looks like theirs. The the Deluxitron. It's like yeah. a, it's like a, a an oversized computer space, and I don't mean oversized in a bad way. It's that's that's been one of the cabinets. Shane <laughs> Shane keeps approaching me and saying, "You're going to buy one, right?" And I keep looking at it, going, "I just don't know where I'd put it. Like right. I'd love one." Um, and you know, we've looked at it, we've we've talked about it for Starcade. Um, and to be honest, it's just one of those things where the, the priorities haven't lined up and I know what's going to happen as soon as I get there and I go, okay, we need one of these for Starcade. <laughs> He's right. going to go, well, we're out. <laughs> yeah, that's always how it happens. <laughs> awesome. Well, I really appreciate you coming on here. Um, before we wrap everything up, I want to know, this is gonna be a really hard question for you. I want to know what are your five all time favorite arcade games? 
That's so um, I like games for a number of different reasons. Um, some games I like for the play, some games I like for the art. I joke that I like to collect games that break and have mirrors in them. Um, so uh, my all time favorite without question is spy hunter, but not just spy hunter. It has to be a cockpit spy hunter. I actually don't play upright spy hunter. Hmm. Um, it's just the, to me, it's one of the few cockpits that you, it just changes the game. Um, Star Wars cockpits are a lot of fun. I was joking with somebody earlier today that, you know, as soon as you buy a Star Wars cockpit, you go, yeah, the upright's not so bad. <laughs> um, so Spy Hunter is definitely number one in my book. Um, another game I really enjoy for the artwork, the feel, and the design is actually one of the Brian Colon games is a Cosmic Cruiser, which uses a mirror and a toy and a screen. And the this little flying saucer actually rotates and is motorized. And the screen and the mirror allow the action to overlay this toy, which is really cool. Um, aside from that, Warlords, I think, is a great game. Um, and I, I really enjoy playing the game. It's a four-player game. Actually, 1UP just released their cabinet. We tried to get licensing a year ago, and 1UP had locked up the licensing, so we weren't able to do it. But it's basically a four-player competitive breakout. Uh, if you haven't played it, you got to play it. Uh, it's one of the few cabinets at my house that when I have a party, there is someone playing that game constantly because they people play it and they go get friends and they're like, hey, you, you got to try this game. Uh, after that, gosh, there's a lot of them I like. Um, I'm, I'm really a sucker for vectors. Um, and I would say... How do I differentiate? I, I, I'm going to be... Uh, kind of normal with this and say I, I do really enjoy Star Wars. Um, I like it for the feel, the vectors, the design of the cabinet. I think it's just a really well presented game. It's not the best gameplay, but it's just fun. Um, and who doesn't want to fly an X Wing, right? I mean, right, right. you got it. You got to go with that. Um, and then after that, God, there's like this huge list in my head of games. Yeah, I'm sure you're thinking of like 40 right now. It's, it's like trying to come up with like, where would I, where would I go next? Where do you draw the line? Yeah. Um, I kind of go in these waves of what I enjoy. Um, one of the ones that I've been, uh, I really have also enjoyed is one that I don't play enough and I'm terrible at. And it's a game called Quantum which is a fairly rare Atari game. It's a vector also. And it's a vector trackball where you're circling atoms and uh, protons and neutrons on a screen and you're making them go away. Uh, and every time you circle them, they go away. And it's you have to be really adept with a trackball to play this game. So people who are good at centipede or millipede would think this is easy. I'm terrible at it, but it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And because it's a vector... And it's trackball controlled. You essentially almost have an analog movement on the screen, which it's hard to appreciate the beauty of analog until you're looking at it like that. Uh, so I think that's that really is one that deserves mention and that I I enjoy. And it's one that I get frustrated with and stop playing, you know, within one or two games because I'm just that horrible at it. But every time I turn it on, I go and play a few games. I mean, that's a pretty good list of five and that's five games that i need to give a try actually i believe i played one of them at your house um the the second one you said um Cosm or the uh, yep cruiser yep yep cruiser that's the one um yeah so before i wrap everything up here i just want you to shout out um anybody you want to shout out social media links uh paradise starcade whatever it may be um, give us those links so that I can drop them in the description so people can find you. Yeah. So uh, give a shout out to Paradise Arcade Shop first. Uh, it's just paradisearcadeshop.com. Um, the other one is Starcade. Uh, I believe I'm going to double check before I get off here, but I believe it's just <laughs> Starcade. Fa so it's facebook.com slash Starcade MN. Yep. Um, and then uh, I give a shout out to Arcade Radio, uh, which is on YouTube at uh, or on it's actually arcaderadio.com. That's R-C-A-D-E-R-A-D-I-O.com. Uh, great podcast if you like hearing about classic arcades. Um, and the, yeah, I mean, it's uh, those are the three things that keep me very busy. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Well, thanks, Brian, again, for coming on. I had a blast talking about everything. Um, like I said before, you always bring up these games that I've never even heard of. So now I need to go do some more research. Um, and for anybody listening, thanks for checking it out. We're back every Friday with a new episode. Um, if you like what we're doing here, subscribe to the YouTube channel, any of the major podcasting channels, and then we're on all social medias as well. I'll throw all those links from Brian in the description so you guys can go check those out. And until next time, peace. Peace.